Good morning. Welcome to Muncie Church on this St. Patrick's Day and this fifth Sunday in Lent. We are so grateful to have you here worshiping with us, and whether that is in this room or via our live stream, we are so glad to start our week worshiping as a community of faith together. If you could take a moment and fill out your Connect card, that will let us know that you were here today. There's a physical version in your bulletin, and there's also one online at muncie.org connect that you can fill out. And there's space if you have questions that we could answer or reach out to you, and also room for prayer requests, and we are always honored to pray alongside you. You can put that in the offering plate or submit that online, and we're grateful that you took a moment to do that. Our update is just full of lots of wonderful information because it's a very busy life in the it's a very busy month in the life of our church and we celebrate that and so I hope you will note all of those things and I wanted to highlight a couple for you. This coming Wednesday night, the 20th, we will have Emmett K. Hill here in concert at 7 o'clock. We will have our regular Wednesday night programs, and then you can come over here for that, and it will be a delightful evening. We have special Muncie Price tickets at the Connection Point this morning, so if you would like to stop by on your way out and get one of those, I know it will be a treat to hear him this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And then next Saturday is our egg hunt, and we are so excited to continue that tradition in our Johnson City community. It will be at King Commons Park in front of the library at 1030, and we can still use candy donations, and we also can use a lot of help the day of. And so if you are available next Saturday, it is a joyful way to volunteer, and you can sign up at muncie.org slash volunteer, or let Katie Jackson know that you are available that day. And also, you will find this little slip of paper in your bulletin. If you've been around for a little while, you know that on Easter Sunday, our worship spaces will be decorated beautifully with Easter lilies, and you can purchase those and give those in honor or in memory of someone. And so you can fill this out. You can drop it in the offering plate or drop it by the church office. But we do need those filled out by Monday, a week from tomorrow. So be sure to get those in. And then lastly, we have a few sympathy notices to extend since this bulletin and this update were printed. So we extend sympathy to the families of Howard Dunbar, who passed away this past week, and also to Russell Stapleton. And so I hope you will surround them with your love and prayers and that you will reach out to those families. And we also have a birth to celebrate. Brett and Chrissy Smith are proud new grandparents. And Kaylin Brown and Kaden Bailey welcomed baby Madeline to the world this week. And if you see Brett buzzing around here, you're going to want to ask for pictures because she is just as cute as she can be. And so we celebrate them and we welcome her already into the life of Muncie Church and love her so well. Again, we are just so grateful to have you worshiping with us today. If you will stand as you are able, in body or in spirit, we will join in our gathering words, which you can find on the front of your bulletin. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Blessed be the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens and forgives our sins.
Let us confess our sin before God and in the presence of one another. Redeeming God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart and have not loved our neighbors as we ought. We have strayed from your commandments. Do not remember our sins, but forgive our iniquities, that we may fix our eyes on you and sin no more. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. May you delight in the joy of your salvation. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as the gathered community of faith and hope, knowing that God is with us and we are not alone, let us offer each other signs of peace, welcome, and reassurance as we greet each other. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad you're here today. I'm Kip Lackson. I'm the senior pastor here at Muncie Church. And it's always a delight to be together. See you in person or via the live stream. And if you're with us today for the very first time, and I've uh, met some first-time guests already before the service, we're delighted that you're here with us as well. Next week, next Sunday, of course, is Palm Sunday and marks the beginning of Holy Week which is the culmination of the season of Lent. You can find on the back of your bulletin all the information about worship opportunities for Holy Week, like Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then, of course, all of the glories of Easter. So I want you to be a part of all of those and share in this time when we bring Lent to its primary focus as we have been journeying together today on this first Sunday, or rather the fifth Sunday, in the season of Lent. I'd like to invite the children to come and join me here on the steps for a few moments. I've got a special gift for each one of them today and for us to share together in a moment. What a privilege that is. Can we sing together, Carlene, as they're coming? right in here close with me. Well, it's great to see you today. You know, today, not only a time when we gather for worship on this Sunday in Lent, but today is also known as what? St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. It is. Now tell me some things about, well, let me ask the question first. Tell me some things about St. Patrick's Day. What do we do? What do we do? You wear green so you don't get pinched? Yeah. What were you going to say? We wear green, and you got on green. I've got a little green on here. Some people do. What else about St. Patrick's Day do you know? Some of the things we do on St. Patrick's Day. We go with that. Do you know? What else? All right. What else? Ooh, leprechauns and shamrocks and clover. Yeah. What is a leprechaun? Does anybody know what a leprechaun? What's a leprechaun? What's a leprechaun? Little tiny 
men that live, that live um, in clovers. Little tiny men that live in clovers? Yeah, and leprechauns, you know, they, they're supposed to bring us good luck. And they're fun. They have a lot of fun. They like to play jokes. Now, let me ask you something. Are, are leprechauns real? Yeah. No, no. It's a part, it's a part of the, the legend that goes with the Irish and the celebration of St. Patrick's Day. You know, there's something about a leprechaun, one of the legends that goes with the leprechaun. It's interesting you mentioned that. I was hoping somebody would. That if you could go to the end of a rainbow, you would find a pot of gold and a leprechaun. And if you catch him, you're able to take the pot of gold with you. That's all great legend and fantasy. I have something here today. I have a pot like this, one for each of you. And then I have some, some, some gold, well, some pretend gold. See these pretend gold coins right here like that? Fool's gold? Well, in some ways it is, and you put them in the pot. Now, I want to say something to you about this. You know, all this stuff related to St. Patrick's Day, the green and the shamrocks and the clovers and the leprechauns and the rainbow and the pot at the end of the rainbow... All of that is fun, and it's fun to imagine and to use our, our, our fantasy imagination and, and think what that might be like. But actually, that's not what St. Patrick's Day is about at all. St. Patrick is a holy day. There was a man named Patrick who over 1,500 years ago, wow, that's a long time, 1,500 years ago, Patrick brought the message of Christ to the people of Ireland. And that's why he's the patron saint, known as St. Patrick of Ireland, because he dared to go into a place that knew nothing or very little at all about Christ and share the message of Christ. And what that really means is that the truth of the matter is found in Christ, not in all of this about leprechauns and green and as fun as that is. I want to share this scripture with you, and then I'm going to give each one of you one of these and a couple of these little fake coins for a purpose Here's what this is really about. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we find these words. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added unto you. What he meant by that is that we're to put him first, to seek first the kingdom of God, to put Christ first in all things, and then all these other things that the world is about, all these other things that we need, like food and clothes and friends and family and love and compassion, all these things will be added to us if we make Christ first in our life. And so I'm going to share one of these with you, and I'm going to keep one myself, and I'm going to keep it as a reminder not to become distracted by all the things around us, but to make sure we keep Christ first in our life. Does that sound good? So I'm going to give you that one. You have that one. It's got those in there. And then I'm going to put it right here, and we'll put two in yours. Lena Kate, you already have one. That's wonderful. Just help yourself. And then I'm going to give that to you. You have one. And here's one for you. There you are. And one for you. And you put them somewhere, maybe in your bedroom, by your bed, or somewhere in your home that you can be reminded of it and say, this is what it's really all about. It's about keeping Christ first in our life. Let's show our children how much you love them today on this holy day.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who dwells in the heavens, but is here among us, and in us, and with us, you have called us into this seasonal walk along the Lenten journey, a path of repentance and self-denial, on which we turn our face and cast our gaze toward the cross of Christ at its end. Long there, standing in the distance, it can be intimidating to contemplate what these final few days and weeks in the life of Christ really meant. And we marvel at its power to kill even the Son of God. But we confess today, O God, that it has been difficult at times to practice spiritual disciplines this week related to Lent, simply because spring is starting to appear around the base of the spindly trunks of seeming lifeless trees and shrubs begin to poke up through the mulch and the dry, brittle leaves, the promise of new life, new hope. They bud upward toward the, the bright sun. And in the Lenten season, we are distracted by the yellow and the purple, the blooming in the midst of the windy chill and in the aftermath of winter's death, reminding us that death was conquered and on the other side of the Lenten journey, when death embraced the Son of God and was smothered by God's love. Thank you, God, for the gift of hope, so colorful, so certain, for reminding us that through the Lenten journey, though it must be completed, there is hope at its end. And that hope is the hope of new life in your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us that hope as we walk through this journey together May we reach forward, still holding tightly to the promise of resurrection that is extended to all of us. Now we ask today, God, that you would hear our prayer, a prayer of praise and thanksgiving as we pray together as Christ has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. As we prepare to give our gifts to God, you may do so however is most convenient to you. The offering plate will pass you by, and there is also information in your bulletin on how to give online to Muncie Church. We are so grateful for your generosity and the gifts that you give. And I wanted to make sure you know that in a few weeks we will take our Easter offering. We have a tradition at Muncie that that offering is missional and goes outside of the walls of this church. And this year we are partnering with Holston Conference for the New Voices campaign that impacts our conference colleges, Wesley Foundations, and camps. And we have many who have grown up in Muncie who are now clergy who have been benefited by those and felt their callings nurtured there. And so we are so grateful to partner with those ministries and hope you will give generously on Easter. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and takes on new life, it remains just a single grain. With grateful hearts, let us bring the fruit of our lives to God as we offer God's tithes and our offerings.
May we offer our gifts to you, gracious God, with thanksgiving and praise. And may our gifts be made perfect through Christ, so that you may be glorified and the world might be blessed in the name of God who created us, Jesus Christ who redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Christ, Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go up into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. These are the words of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God.
may be seated. And following that outstanding anthem, there was that moment when we all wanted to show our appreciation for such great music today. Let's do that now and show our appreciation to the choir. Thank you. This morning I am sharing the 10th message in this series, The Dirty Dozen in Search of the Twelve Apostles. And we have been each Sunday walking through these 12 apostles and we come to the 10th today. Next Sunday we will focus on Judas Iscariot infamously. And Easter Sunday we will contemplate the one we usually call Doubting Thomas. But today we come to one that is not as well known. Today we focus on the apostle we call and have historically called down through Christian history, James the Less. There are two apostles named James. We focused last Sunday on James the Great, and today we come to James the Less. I'm not sure I would want to be known as James the Less, but nonetheless, no pun intended, he is identified as such in Christian history. Why is that? What do we know about James the Less? Contrasted with the other James, who's the brother of an apostle named John, and usually referred to as Peter, James, and John, this is a different apostle known as James the Less. What does that mean? In the ancient world, they distinguish people that way, James the Great, James the Less. But what it means is important. James the Less can refer to his height. It could mean that he is the shorter one of the two apostles named James. That's a possibility. But there's another one, and I think this is the right one because this is really what the Scripture says about him. To refer to him as James the Less is to suggest that he is younger than the other apostle named James. As a matter of fact, we have a reference in the New Testament like that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15 and the 40th verse, this apostle is referred to as James the Younger, which means that biblical scholars recognize that this James the Less is the younger of the two apostles named James. All gospels refer to him, or all the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke refer to him in this manner. In the gospel itself, in Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 6, and in the reading for today from the Acts of the Apostles, he is referred to. Now, in this scripture reading, following the ascension, when Jesus ascends into heaven and promises them the Holy Spirit, and then the voices tell them that he will return, then the gospel writer talks about how these people, these apostles, return to the city of Jerusalem and then goes through the process of naming them. And as he's naming the apostles in this per particular pericope of Scripture, he identifies James and John, that's James the Great. But then later on, if you noticed as he's listing their names, he refers to this one as James the son of Alphaeus. This is a reference to this James the Less. How do we know that? The New Testament doesn't tell us that, but outside the pages of the New Testament, in a biblical archaeological discovery of an ancient fragment that dates to about 70 A.D., 70 years after the time of Christ, this little ancient document is entitled Expositions of the Sayings of Our Lord. You will find this, this reference. It says, James... The son of Mary, not Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, this is a different Mary. James, the son of Mary, the wife of Alphaeus, whose son was an apostle of Jesus. This extra biblical reference, coupled with him being called James the Less or James the Younger, is a reference outside the New Testament to these lives of apostles. This James the son of Mary and Alphaeus, was an apostle of Jesus. What else do we know about James? James is never quoted. James the Less, James the Younger, or the son of Alphaeus, however you want to refer to him, is never quoted in the pages of the New Testament. Not one sentence, not one word, not one quote. We don't really know anything about his life outside of his name as a part of of the New Testament or this extra biblical reference. And by the way, this extra biblical reference that I just talked about is the only one outside of the New Testament where we have this James, the son of Alphaeus, mentioned. 
And I must confess to you that we know a lot more about a lot of these other apostles and we're able to talk about that and preach about that, but I had kind of struggled. I've struggled saying, okay, well, outside of what I just shared, what do we say about this apostle? We would like to know more and more about his family life, his children perhaps, where he lived, where he grew up. We'd like to know how it was that Jesus came to call this apostle. We don't know that. We know that he called some from their fishing profession, others from tax collecting, but we don't know anything about how Jesus called this James the less to be a part of his circle of 12 apostles. But as I was struggling with that, then I came to grips with it and I realized therein lies the message. You say, what do you mean? Whoever he was and whatever else we would like to know about him and all that's left unsaid about this James the less, here's what we do know, that Jesus saw something in him Jesus saw something in this James that he called him and invited him and commissioned him to be a part of his 12 apostles. Even though there's much more we would like to know, what we do know, and perhaps that's all the gospel writer really wanted us to know, was that these are people in which Jesus saw something in each of them and said, you, you, that's who I want. I want you to come and not just follow me, not just be a disciple, but I want to call you to be a part of my circle of 12, my 12 apostles. Here's the way I like to say it, and, and I really feel that the Spirit of God has placed this upon my heart for a, a special reason this morning, and it is that Jesus saw the best in James the less. Jesus saw the best in in this apostle James as he saw the best in all the others. There was something within each of them, Judas Iscariot included, that he said, I want you to come and be one of my apostles. And thinking about it that way, that whatever or whoever or from wherever he was from, James the less, Jesus saw the best in him. And he called it out to become one of his apostles. And what I would like to do is I would like to take the word best, if I may, B-E-S-T, and paint you a picture of Jesus and his relationship with James the Less and all of the other apostles. Using this word best as an inclusive way, I want to show you how Jesus related to these apostles. And it's all there in the pages of the New Testament. The first is this, that Jesus believed in them. Jesus believed in James. He saw something in this person and said, I want you to be my apostle. Jesus believed in all those he called. He didn't just flip a coin or draw straws or randomly choose. He chose each of these 12 apostles for a purpose. He saw the best in them. He saw the best in James. We are the same, are we not? We need people to believe in us. Jesus believed in them. He believed in James. He believed in the other apostles. We need people to believe in us. We need someone to believe in us. I confess to you today as well that I would be less of a person. I wouldn't be standing here today if there were not people in my past life who believed in me. Even when I didn't believe in myself, even when I questioned my calling, my ability, there were people there in my life to believe in me, just like Jesus believed in these apostles. And when I think of someone who believed in me, I just can't help but be reminded of a, of, a, of, a, of a lady named Mrs. Hargrove. Mrs. Hargrove was my seventh grade English teacher at the school that I grew up in and where I went from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. When you entered seventh grade, you moved across the campus from the elementary building into the high school building. So you were all there in seventh grade through 12th grade. And now that could be really intimidating shoved around in the hallway and fighting for lockers with seniors and juniors. I mean, you're trying to be somebody now and you're in the high school building. You're, you're growing up. And in the seventh grade, I entered Miss Hargo's class. Now, I'd had some friends and made some new friends in seventh grade. And we decided that where we wanted to sit in the class was in the back. You know, look cool, sit in the back. And we could talk and chatter and, and we could snicker and sit in the back. Well, when we came to Mrs. Hargrove's class for that very first time and she was reading through the list of the students, she came to my name and she pronounced my name and then she looked up over her glasses at me sitting back there in the back. 
She paused there a moment and she went on. Later, after class was concluded and the bell rang and we began to move on to our next class, we had our little cards out to see which room number we went to next. She stopped me at the door after everybody had left. And she said, what are you doing sitting in the back with all those boys? Now see, here's the thing you need to know about Miss Hargrove. She went to Isom's Chapel United Methodist Church where I grew up. She knew me. I lived in a community you couldn't get away with anything. Somebody knew somebody who knew you. And here she was. I see her on Sunday. I see her Monday through Friday. What a deal. I mean, why couldn't I have had somebody else? And she looked at me and she said, I know your mama and I know your daddy. And I know that they wouldn't want you sitting in the back with those boys. So tomorrow, beginning tomorrow, you're going to sit right here in the front, right here. My shoulders slumped and fell. I realized this wasn't going to work out like I had wanted it. I was seeking rebellion. I was wanting to do something dramatic. And she then looked at me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Kip, I believe in you. And I know that God has his hand on your life. So I'm going to see you tomorrow right there in that front seat. I went on to college and seminary, and then when I was ordained into the ministry, I would often go back and preach at my home church, and there she'd be. And she'd come up with this big smile, and she'd hug me, and she'd say, aren't you glad I moved you to the front row? <laughs> she believed in me. Jesus believed in those apostles. Regardless of their failures and shortcomings and idiosyncrasies, you got to have somebody to believe in you. Jesus believed in them. He believed in James. He believed in the others. Not only did he believe in them, but Jesus encouraged them. All through the pages of Scripture, Jesus is encouraging his apostles to live to their full potential, to be the person God wanted them to be. Over and over again, Jesus encourages them. And that's something that we rarely talk about. We, we know when Jesus reprimanded them or when Jesus had some harsh words for them, but more often than not, Jesus was encouraging them. One of my favorites is in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel where Jesus says this to his apostles. Now catch what Jesus says. He says to them, you have seen me do great works, but you will do greater works than these. Now, now think about how that would have landed on these apostles. We're going to do greater works than you have done? I mean, they had seen Jesus do all kinds of amazing things and restore the sight to the blind man, heal the broken, change lives. And here's Jesus saying, you will do greater works than these, even that I have done. He's encouraging them. But I believe Jesus said that for a reason. I think this is what Jesus meant by that. Jesus knew that as one man in one place at one time, and by the way, Jesus never traveled more than 50 miles from his hometown. He never went farther than that little sliver of land we call Judea, as far as we know. He never wrote a book. He never had a bestseller. He never philosophized in a classroom. None of that. But yet, in the lives of these apostles, when he raised them up and sent them out, he knew that their impact would be greater than his. He encouraged them in that way. Not only did he believe in them, and not only did he encourage them, but in seeing the best in them, he also shared with them. He believed in them, he encouraged them, he shared with them. Jesus is sharing himself with these apostles. Think about it like this. When he invited all these apostles to leave whatever it was they were doing and follow him, they spent three years with him. He shared his life, they shared stories, they shared evening time, they shared daytime, they traveled through the country evangelizing, they shared, but he did more than that. As I said a moment ago, again and again in the pages of Scripture, Jesus shares meals with his apostles. The feeding of the 5,000, what did he do when the crowd had left? He had the apostles pick up all the leftovers, and there were 12 baskets full. At the Last Supper, he's sharing a meal with his apostles. Following his resurrection on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, he has breakfast prepared for his apostles. He's sharing with them. 
He wasn't looking at them from a distance. He didn't keep them at arm's length. He pulled them into his life, and he shared himself with them. And you say, well, is he doing that with us now? Yes, of course. What do you think Holy Communion is all about? When we break bread and pass the cup, it's a sharing of Christ with us in a way like he shared himself with his apostles. He believed in them. He encouraged them. He shared himself with them. And then here I think is a big one. He trusted them with the work of the building of his church and of his kingdom. He trusted them. You know, it's quite impressive when you realize that Jesus brought together this motley crew of apostles, and then, just when they least expected it, happens what happens in this scripture. He ascends. He tells them the Spirit is coming upon them. And then what does he say to them? His very last words, according to Matthew's gospel in the 28th chapter of Matthew, he looked at them before he left this earth and said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's trust. Jesus trusted these apostles to carry forth the message of his gospel and good news and build the church of Jesus Christ in the earth. And when you take a look at their life, you wonder... Did he trust the right people? I mean, was he trusting the right group? Was this really the group to be trusted? I mean, some of them, I probably wouldn't trust you wouldn't either. I wouldn't trust Judas Iscariot farther than I could throw him across the sanctuary space. And what about Simon Peter? He was always speaking up when no one asked. He was always talking when everybody else was quiet. I mean, would we trust these people? Jesus did. He trusted them with the building of the kingdom. What happened to James the Less? Well, the most reliable record we have about his demise, if you will, is from St. Jerome. St. Jerome, writing in the 300s, he did a study of the lives of the apostles, and he wrote them down so that we might have them for posterity. And he tells us in his writings that based on his research, James the Less, around 62 AD, went to the city of Jerusalem and was preaching on the steps of the temple during the Passover. The Passover was the largest festival in Judaism, and Jews came from all around the world. There would have been hundreds, if not thousands of people in the city of Jerusalem. He had a great crowd, and he stood on the steps of the temple, and he was preaching the, the message of Jesus Christ. It angered the high priest. The high priest was the leader of the religious establishment in Jerusalem, and it angered the high priest that he would be preaching Jesus in the Passover, and he had James the Less arrested had him taken to the top of the temple and pushed off where he fell to his death. And then the high priest declared him to be a heretic in Hebrew history. Now you see, what is the message for us in this? When you think about how Jesus saw the best in each of these individuals, saw the best in James the less, he believed in him, he encouraged him, he shared himself with him, he trusted them you see, what that says to us today is this, does it not? That he sees the best in each of us. And he wants to take that and use it for his glory if we are willing. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know some of you are thinking, oh, I don't know if he, I don't know if he sees the best in my life. I mean, hey, pastor, you, you don't know what I've done. You, you don't know the things in my past. I mean, I'm not sure he sees the best in me. I mean... I, I'm not like any of these people. I, I don't measure up to any of these apostles. and I'm not like any of these characters that we eulogize in the pages of Scripture. I'm not sure that God really sees the best in me and wants to use me that way. Oh, really? Have you ever looked at the lives of these people that bespeak the pages of Scripture and who they were and what they were about? I mean, really, have you? I mean, let me just give you a taste. Noah, Noah had a drinking problem. Abraham was too old, they said. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob had a problem stretching the truth. Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Moses had a speech impediment and asked God to choose his brother instead of choosing him. Gideon was afraid of his own shadow and hid out in the wine press, hoping that God would miss him somehow. Solomon, well, let's just say it, Solomon was a womanizer. 
hundreds of wives and thousands of concubines. I mean, that's what it is. Rahab was a prostitute. David was responsible for the murder of a man so he could have the man's wife for himself. Elijah struggled with depression and asked God if he could die. Jonah ran from God and got into a whale of a problem just because he wouldn't let God do his work in his life. Job went bankrupt. Simon Peter denied knowing Jesus not once, twice, but three times while he warmed his hands by the enemy's fire. Martha was a worry wart. She worried about everything and about everybody and almost missed the very feet of Jesus. The Samaritan woman was married and divorced multiple times. Zacchaeus was a cheater and took money from people who needed it more than he did and got wealthy on the backs of the people. The apostle Paul, previous known as Saul of Tarsus, persecuted and killed Christians before he had his own run in and God had to knock him off his high horse and redeem him from himself. Timothy was thought to be too young and inexperienced. Lazarus was dead. And all the other 12 apostles forsook Jesus and fled in the time of life when he needed them the most. So the next time you think God wouldn't use somebody like you. Think again. Because every one of these people I've mentioned had problems and hang-ups and sins and struggles, but God saw the best in them and he used them for his glory. And if God can do that with all of these, what can God do with us when we're willing to let him see the best? I'm giving you a prayer a prayer to pray between now and the glory of Easter tide. It's simple. It'll change your life. It goes like this. Oh God, see the best in me and use me in spite of myself for your glory and for your honor in building your kingdom. God, see the best in me and use me in spite of myself for your glory and honor in the building of your kingdom. God sees the best in us and wants to use it if we're willing to let him have it. And when we're willing to let him have it, from Noah all the way down to the 12 apostles themselves, God does great things in spite of ourselves because he sees the best in us. He believes in you. He wants to encourage you by the power of his Holy Spirit. He shares himself with us continually. And he trusts us to walk faithfully with him. See the best in you, O oh God. And use it for your glory, honor, in the building of your kingdom. Never think less than the best of yourself because you are a child of the living God. Now, for God's sake, let's start living like it and let him use us just as he's used so many others. Would you take your bulletin in which you'll find the words of the Apostles' Creed, this great historic affirmation of faith. And when you have it in hand, stand with me as you are able, as we affirm our faith together, uniting our voices with the saints through the ages who've declared their faith in these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
as the light of Christ prepares to go out before us into the world beyond these walls. I look forward to sharing Palm Sunday with you next week and the beginning of Holy Week together. And God has something wonderful to do in each of our lives as we open ourselves to Him. Until we're together again in this place to rejoice, to celebrate, to sing, to share, to experience the presence of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And you're going out and in your coming in, in your rising up and in your lying down, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears. Until we all come to stand before him on that day where there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen and amen.